In her 23-year career on the pitch, England's most capped player, Farrah Williams, has bagged two WSL titles, an FA Cup and an MBE. She made an appearance at the 2012 Olympics, joined the Lionesses at three World Cups and played at four European Championships. Narrowly missing out on bringing a Euro trophy home for England in 2009. All in all, Farrah racked up 172 caps for the national side and even more for her clubs before retiring in 2021. But she's also faced more than her fair share of challenges too. Now a TV pundit and fellow podcaster, we sat down to talk about women's football, life after retirement and what men can do to help grow the women's game. Okay, listen, I want to introduce you to today's guest, England Lioness legend, 172 appearances. Today, welcome Farrah Williams. Thanks for having me. Listen, it's been a long time. Um, Really, really pleased you've, you've found some time in your schedule to come and spend some time chatting with me. I'm sure we'll cover as much as we can cover. I'll tell you what I did do yesterday, last night. A little bit of homework for me is um, I looked at your 10 best goals. Not bad, right? Decent, <laughs> decent. Not bad. Listen, Probably my last 10 goals, my best list, ones as Let's well. talk about football because that's what you are, you know, known for, being a mm-hmm. footballer. And, you know, 10 goals, left foot, right foot. And from what I saw, most of them was outside, outside of the box. So I'm, I'm doubly impressed with that, by the way, because I didn't strike, score. That's what I'm saying. Look. I didn't score many from outside <laughs> the goal, but also I, I did see you play. You know, I've watched some games. Most of the, most of the best goals was at Reading. Would, mm. would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I think what had happened as a, as a kid growing up, when you're a street kid playing the cage, you think you're an attacker, and I, I used to think I was, you know, an old school number ten. You know, one that had a little bit of skill, vision, mm-hmm. could create stuff like them shots from distance. And I think because the women's game was so amateur back then, and I learned and developed understanding of the game quite young, I then was put into a holding midfield position throughout my okay. career. So it was actually Hope Power when I got into the England team at 17, mm. kind of brought me back from that 10. I'd played there occasionally, but most of the time I'd sit in front of the back four and read the game and kind of dictate play from a deeper position. Mm. So I pretty much spent my whole career as a, as a four, so a deep midfielder. Restricted. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and then it wasn't until I went to Reading at the end of my career I just wanted to I was at Arsenal before I went then you know I started the game because I loved the game of football and I kind of lost that at at Arsenal for many different reasons and Mm. fell out of love with the game and didn't want to retire on that note I didn't want to retire unhappy hating the game so I went to Reading and tried to get that love back for the game and when I was there the coach was like you're wasted as a four and You know, their promise was to me at the time, because obviously I was on more money at Arsenal, was, you know, we can't offer you that sort of money, but what we can offer you is that we'll improve you as a player. And I'm like, I'm 33, man. You you know, I haven't got long left. But they gave you the freedom. And they improved me. And and honest to God, it it was the most enjoyable coaching I've had as a player in terms of learning technical, like people used to say to me, you're one of the most technical gifted players. And I used to think I was okay, but I knew there was a lot more to learn. And he just got stuck into me technically and, Literally, my game in those four years that I spent at Reading just progressed massively. And I was gutted. I was like, man, I wish I had you when I was a kid. Like, I wish I had you earlier in my career mm-hmm. because, you know, my career could have played out a little bit different. Not that I regret any part of my career, but I enjoyed playing as a 10. I enjoyed, yeah, you know, those last four years. I, I felt like I was a kid again with that little bit of freedom and creativity that had probably been coached out of me a little bit because I understood the game ahead of the game where the women's game weren't professional. It certainly showed because, as you said, as a senior pro, as a senior player, you know, if you get the wrong coach, wrong manager, they can retire you early. There's nothing worse is there than being at a place and you're thinking, oh, you're killing me. But you can see the freedom. You know, as I said, I enjoyed the goals. Um, I was surprised, you know, some of them were from distance. But, you know, technically, uh, always proficient. I see you taking corners, free kicks. Mm. You know, it's my ball. I get on everything. <laughs> you know, that was you. But listen, for England, phenomenal. Phenomenal. And your goal scoring record was decent as well. Mm. So no one should be surprised. So if you get a chance, go on, check out Farrah's 10 best goals. I'm sure you'll be impressed. Yeah, definitely. And were, most of them were against Liverpool. <laughs> I've seen that. And you I played for Everton. Yeah. And I then know. you played for Liverpool. How does that work I know. out? I know. Cardinal Sin, you know that, right? For some. In a men's game. The women's <sighs> game, a little bit different. You know what? I had to. I had to for my... They were going professional. That was my opportunity to go professional. Yeah. Semi-professional. Mm. Um. So I had to, yeah, run across the park, mate. I sprinted across that park, <laughs> signed the papers, and yeah. then went from blue to red. But yeah, it was difficult because Everton, as a club at the mm-hmm. time, for me in my personal life and the manager there was so good to me. So to do 
to do that. And to be fair, I probably overspent my time at Everton because the manager was so good to me. Yeah. And um, and I mean so good to me off the field because you know I had struggles yeah, in my itching, off the field during that during that time. And it wasn't until mm. she retired from Everton as a coach, I felt the freedom to just leave and go and experience something different. So kind of come hand in hand when she when she left the club. Listen, there's no that. there's no loyalties in football. People uh, talk about. I wish this, I knew that when I was yeah, playing, you know man. What? I wish have, I knew that. We have I, these honestly. conversations with with fans and uh, people all the time. And mm. how did you do it? I, I played for County. I played for Forest. Yeah. I played for Mansfield. Listen, you, sometimes it's not in your hands. You have to move on. You know, the manager doesn't want you. you, you it's time to go. So you need to earn a living. So it's not about loyalties. And I can't play for the. You know, yeah, but the you, local know, you side. know what's hard with that? You know, like as a person, like I'm such a loyal person. Yeah. Like take sport out of this. Like me, law is up there. Like, mm. and so that's where I struggled. Yeah, but you got to eat. Because I just right? had, yeah, exa- yeah. exactly. Yeah. I didn't think like that. I'd rather not eat and, and show that loyalty to somebody. I'd give everything okay. so that you could see that loyalty with me. And mm. yeah, only now, uh, you know, you come to the end of your career, I would give that advice. There's yeah, no loyalties in the game. You've got to do what's right for you in those moments. But I wish I could tell myself that as a, as a player when I played. Because I wouldn't have been at clubs for as long as I was at, for sure. Well, that's I think that's what we're about now. We've been there, won a t-shirt, so to speak, that we can pass mm. on that brutal, real yeah. talk to younger players mm. and say, look, you got to look after yourself. That is yeah. the bottom line. It's that's not true. about greed, but be professional, look after yourself, what suits you for family life. You know, I used to commute to all of my clubs. I wasn't relocating. Mm. I used to fall out with managers. I just knew my family life was more important. Like, yeah. like what happens when you're fed up with me and you don't want me and you tell me on a Monday, you're not in my plans, you know, I'm going to get rid of you. But I've just relocated and moved Mm-mm. the kids to school and nobody cares. Yeah. When no. you talk to fans like that, they kind of get it. They're like, oh, wow. Honestly, it wasn't until I was at Reading at the time and you always think that, the, you know, when you're at a club that you're loved, the managers love you yeah. and you're, you're their priority. From and it seat. wasn't, it was at Reading in my second season. I remember I'd come back from having just a minor up on my foot and I said to the manager, because, you know, in terms of relationships with managers, I actually had, mm. apart from my Arsenal, really good relationships with with the coaches. And I remember saying to her as we're walking to the pitch, I said, mate, you don't care about us. We're just another number. What do you mean? I said, mm. you're already searching for the next player of to course. take my shirt. And she laughed and, and, and it, it's the truth. And, it I, and, and I see it so, so often that, it, you know, you are a number until somebody else takes that number. And Brutal. it's difficult. It, it, it is. And Brutal it's difficult reality. Because you don't, when you're there, even when you first sign, they're still mm. looking to replace you. Of course. You're just there for a short period. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're filling... What, what's needed at the requirements at that time of course and I was, course. as I say I was 35 when I made this comment so far too uh, late in my career to even process what, what was happening throughout your career alright so you know for people watching transfer deadlines just closed um, really interesting for the women's game mm. you know first time I've really looked at it in depth and thought there's a lot going on um, Alicia Russo I mean Arsenal mm. nearly tried twice apparently 500k World record transfer, if they would have done that, that shows where the game's moved on, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's certainly grown massively, certainly since I was a player. It's interesting because those rumours there that come out, now we have a exposure broadcasters that are prepared to put it out there, journalists, you know, that are prepared to say that it's happening. But it's pretty much happened throughout the game without a fee but for, for years, yeah. you know, under the, you know, you get that call. From, from coaches, let's sign a pre-agreement, no one knows about it and mm. it's all secretive without agents being involved as well. Yeah. I remember, you know, I'd signed a pre-agreement when I was at a, a club before. So it happens and they don't, doesn't really come out. Yeah, um, and it, it's nice that, yeah, as you say, the game is, that there is money in the game now. It's nice that we're, we're, we're seeing and hearing those types of transfers. I mean, what was impressive was for Man United to turn it down because it would yeah. have been so easy for them to say, you know, half a million, we'll take that. But, but she's out of contract, right? Yeah. In the, but you know what? I was thinking about this because I kind of, when I compare it to the men's game, it's completely different. The women's game run off a budget that the men give to women's teams yeah. from the beginning of the season. So, for example, if Man United go, right, we're just going to give the women's team £3 million and that's them for the year. Mm. They go with that £3 million. Say I'm a head coach at United. He's probably thinking, or United as a club are thinking, right, we know that that's just wasted money anyway. So to get half a million back, we weren't expecting it. So why are we going to give up the opportunity? Mm. They're top of the league, don't forget. Yeah, I've seen that. Why would and I Arsenal give up our, our, one of our best players, key to the t- key yeah. to the squad, never qualify for the Champions League before, mm. and now to attract the best players in the world, yeah. you need to be in the Champions League. So why would you give up that for 500 that you already didn't think that you were going to have anywhere at the end of the year? Insight. So for me, smart, even yeah. if they lose her at the end of the year. But if they, what, what, they, what they do by keeping her is that if they get in the the Champions League or if they win the league 
she might want to stay anyway. She's a United fan, so yeah, yeah, she'll probably want to be there anyway. Listen, this is the insight, you know, for people that may understand the men's game and not understand the women's game. This is important to, you know, disclose mm. that stuff to people because I have conversations with men all the time about the women's game and, you know, they don't get it or they don't want to listen. And I like, don't get it either. <laughs> no, you get it, you get <laughs> no, it. Come on, you, you, you've got the insight. And this no, is the importance of, of sharing that wealth mm. of knowledge to give people a better understanding because when people keep trying to compare the men's and women's <sighs> game, it's so that. unfair, right? Yeah. It's a completely different model. But we don't help ourselves. As female, athletes, as female footballers because when we asked about the comparisons between the two we only we only are brave enough to say that it's the physical it's, I've heard you say this before it, it's, this it's is not refreshing. true it's not true technically we're so far off the men's game and I would only say that the, 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 you know we're close to being in terms of game understanding and tactical understanding I'd mm. say we're up there for sure equally mm. we see the game like the men, it's, you know, it's, that, that's easy to, the easy part of the game to get. But physically and technically, the women's game is so far off the men's game. Explain, I elaborate only, on the technical side of it. I've never been, as I said, the only time I actually technically got coached, detail, mm. how to receive, thinking about the speed in which the ball's coming towards you and how you have to adjust your feet and work your feet to receive, ball in the air, how I have to adjust, get yeah. behind the ball, underneath, whatever it might be. Those details were never, ever coached to me throughout my career. Never, ever until my last four years at Reading. That's so incredible. you just would receive the ball whether it's coming at you 100 miles an hour. Just get on with it. Or you'd, you'd, you'd be in the same body position. Yeah, could you don't adjust that. your body. And, mm. You know, we always used to get told, back foot, big touch out your foot. We're actually giving, losing control of the ball with them big touches. Yeah. So I feel in terms of technical detail, it's not been in the women's game. We haven't mm. had the coaches, the coach quality within the women's game to put us on a level with the men. And you guys had it from yeah. academy level. Yeah. And no, also I never touches as a kid. the ball. Every single day you're not training. The women I coached, yeah. you know, I've coached through at the um, Centre of Excellence in the women's game mm. through my playing career. And it's, you know, twice a week in the evening. By the yeah. time you get them in, and don't get me wrong, you, don't, you, have, to get, you have to run. So you, you, you take out half an hour for running, you take out half an hour for warm-up, cool-down, whatever it might be, all the chatting in between. They get an hour contact That's time. That's old school. You have to run. You know, yeah. And not with a yeah, ball. Yeah, of course, because they're only there I mean? twice a week. So you're trying to introduce them to it. Fitness. So we're so far off of it. And like even, you know, you go to, um, you go soccer aid. I did soccer aid two years on the balance and you're with, mm. you know, retired pros and whatever, just in a rondo. Yeah, yeah. Flipping out the size of the rondo. <laughs> it's like tiny. And I'm like, yeah, you've got to be good. It? Otherwise, you're yeah, getting exposed. Mm. Whereas in the women's game, the rondo's massive, really? big time, two touches. Okay. So I'm saying that just shows you yeah. the difference in, in the technical ability. Mm. I'm not saying there's not some technically mm. great players in our game. Of course there is. Yeah. But, we're on a journey to professionalism. Just mm. because we have that label now, it doesn't mean to say all of a sudden you can compare us to what the men's professional game looks like. No. That's been going for many a years. No, you're right. You know, and your brutal honesty, I think, is what the, comes through. through. The, I the mean, when you're, when you're on air and you're talking, mm. I think it's refreshing to hear that. But we will always get compared, right? Mm. If we don't be honest about it. Oh, so, yeah, we were talking about obviously the technical aspect of the game and things that people don't realise. But, you know, some things I want to talk about as well regarding the transfers, obviously the window is some other players that have moved on, like, um, you know, if you look at Jordan Nobbs. Mm. I mean, that was a bit of a surprise. That would have been, I'd imagine, a bit of a wrench for her to move on as well. A difficult one. She'd obviously moved down from the North East to Arsenal as, a, as mm. a young kid and spent many years. And, you know, she's now a club legend at Arsenal for the mm -hmm. amount of trophies she'd won there, the, the amount of games she played and, and the duration that she was there. But for Jordan, she, you know, she suffered with injuries in the last three, four years, yeah. um, ACLs, hamstrings, you know, she missed the, the World Cup 2015 for injury. She then missed the World Cup, uh, sorry, the um, World Cup 2019 for injury. And then she got left out of the yeah. Euros Heart again breaking. here for an injury that come late. Mm. Um, and they didn't want to risk her trying to get back in time for that. So yeah, for her, I think, and, and her seeing that success of the, the Lionesses and not playing and being a regular at Arsenal, she has to move. She has yeah. to go and play football. And, and for me, sometimes it's not even, and I know her, I'm sure her motivation I've heard in interviews is to get back in the Lioness squad. Mm. But for me, when you're a football person and you've been used to playing for that duration of time, you just want to play football. You, you need to play regularly. You just yeah. need to be playing because it doesn't matter what you're getting paid. It doesn't matter if you're in the best club and you can tell people, yes, I'm at Arsenal. Mm. If you're not happy, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you go home and you're so unhappy in your life. And even when, you know, I was watching Jordan, you know, part of me, it, it, you know, it hurt for her because I'd see her come on and she just didn't look like the same person. She mm. completely lost herself. 
in in our Arsenal squad to, towards the end of the, you know our time there. So I think a great move in terms of the ambition that Aston Villa was showing with the players they brought in, and for herself to get back playing more regularly uh, in a team and you know give herself a chance if if she is to go or want to go to the World Cup in the summer. I can certainly relate. There were times when I was at clubs that I had years on contracts, and I was like, as soon as I wasn't in the team, I was knocking on the door. Mm. Get me out of here. It's time for me to move on because time is short. I, mm. I, I had a long-term injury where I was out for a year. Rachel Patel attending. I think when you're in those moments, you think, I can't waste any any more minutes. You need to be playing, right? Something like that. You know what I, you know what I struggle what I struggle with massively is that when you're a top player in a top team and you're not playing and you sit there for years and accept that. Waste. And I understand that you have to have squad players. I get that. Mm. But you're there's some top players that sit in teams and I think, what are you doing? If you can this play somewhere else, short. Like, go, go and somewhere play. Else. And especially in the women's game, like go somewhere else. Yeah. Like, you, you know, and, and for me, if I was to be at a team where, you know, I have no involvement in terms of on-pitch involvement and I stay at a team for 10 years and mm. I walk away from the game with, you know, every trophy. Regrets. But not even that, but people walk away and, you know, on paper, they've been at a club for 10 years, right? They've played not much. Mm. And they walk away with all these, you know, accolades and yeah, trophies yeah. and all that. But you, you're part in that. It wouldn't feel the same as me going, yeah. actually, I featured and started, yeah. you know, 100 games in, in my career, for example. It, it would mean more to me that I'm playing and trying to impact on the pitch than to go, I've won everything, but I didn't play. That might be that might be a mentality, new generation. Yeah. That yeah. might be a change in mentality, a, cha- mm. yeah, a change in shift. When I speak to young players, it's like they're more accceptant of certain behaviours, like in terms of, you know, I'm a squad player and, and things like that would, I was never that no, person. I, can't I could that never person. deal. I'd be miserable around the place. <laughs> Me too. Toxic. For, for real, you can't. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how, you've got to be a certain person to be yeah. able to do that because for me, it wasn't for me. Mm. Like I understand and, you know, you get to an age where potentially, you, you know, you become a, a more of a, a squad player, a sub, whatever mm. it might be, but, I was just never that person. My that drove you, was never That drove you to, to where that. you needed Couldn't to get to, it. Right? I would never, Yeah, but I wouldn't even allow it. Mm. You know, if you're a sub, that ain't happening for too long for me because I'm like, what am I doing to get myself back in? What do I need to do? Yeah, of course. And I would do my utmost and that I understand football enough to understand football is about opinions and sometimes mm. a, a preference of a coach or a manager isn't your style and mm. that's fine. I think what players struggle with is that. Yeah. You know, they think that there's a, an agenda behind coaches or managers that they don't like you because they're not playing you. Sometimes it's just you, you don't fit what, what they're... Listen, you're not good enough in the day. Because yeah. yeah. if you was, you'd but be you in know, the team. In the women's game, they, they don't have coaches that are like that. They don't, they don't have enough coaches that are just honest. Ruthless. Like, and, I, and I think that's why Serena Vegan's done so well with the Lionesses because she's just black and white. You know, if you're third choice striker, you're third choice striker. Because I think this the one who's number one is better than you. Not that you're crap. You're just not better than my number one choice. And that, that, because what, what they often do in the game, they go, oh, you know what? You can't play with your left foot. Go and practice that. So you go and practice weeks on end, you come back and, and you've improved it. And they go, you can't head. So they're something. just feeding yeah. you something to make you feel just like you're like missing. Post. Yeah. Just be yeah. honest. You're my number, you're number, number two, my number three choice. And there's nothing that you can do. Mm. Continue to improve, of course, but there's nothing you can do right now to put you ahead of this player that's ahead of you. Just say it. Because no. then you know. Yeah. It's not, it's not, there's no, there's no agenda behind that. There's nothing behind it. And we can move forward with that. Yeah. That's how I work. No. Like, that's how I would work. You make a good coach or manager. The, um, yeah, but they don't pay enough. Come on, otherwise I would be. There you go. <laughs> no, we'll, co- we'll cover that, we'll cover that later on. We'll cover that later on. One more player, um, Beth England. Mm. Moving from, you know, your club mm. to Tottenham. Yeah. Huh? London rivalry and all that. I should've think we happened. covered that, didn't we? Should have happened ages ago. Yeah? Not, not to talk, just in general. She should have moved ages ago yeah. for me. She went on loan a few years back now to Liverpool and she had a really successful loan spell at Liverpool and Emma Hayes brought her back to Chelsea and, mm. and she'd come back to Chelsea and still didn't have a run of games and still was that squad player. Yeah. You know, she's a goal scorer. Her attributes are getting into the box, hard working, will work for you for 90 minutes plus mm. and, and is not afraid to get into areas that, you know, other players are. Get her head on it, for jump at things, you know, roll her leg. If the ball's going up, she'll do something to keep it, to get it into the back of the net. Mm. She was never going to be a regular starter at Chelsea. And when they brought Sam Kerr in, that should yeah, have been, for her, that should have been the writing on the wall, you're yeah. right. And it was like, for me, she should have gone before. And I feel like if she had, her England career would have been yeah. far further down the line than what it is. Proper centre forward, whenever and, uh, I've seen her play. She stayed and it was one of those. And I understood it because, and I understood it from Chelsea's point of view, mm. you need squad players. Yeah, But for her, 
to get more regular game time when you come off the back of a really good Selfishness, low spell what we spoke about sometimes before sometimes you've got to be yeah you've got to be, yeah. to be a top it'll, top player it'll be a good move for her I think mm. I think I mean, she's got two in three now um, so I think it'll be a good move for her she's got a couple of good players around her Tottenham are trying to build um, so we'll see how that, that develops but yeah it was a record fee as well from uh, English club to English club I see that Domestic, so, yeah. domestic, domestic record. record so that yeah. just keeps showing that the, the mm. game is is progressing mm. and moving. So, I mean, yeah. So, a lot of players I've noticed over the years, top English players, when I played in the states, did you ever have an opportunity to do that? And obviously, we've bought players back here. I understand now the WSL product is the best product, so we're mm. able to get the best players. But a lot of our players went back to the states. Did you ever have the opportunity? Was that yeah. for you? I had a, yeah, I had a, a couple of opportunities to go there. Um, and other teams, I was, uh, when I played in Europe for, for Everton, we'd play against, you know, a Norwegian team and they'd put, because in the women's game back then, they used to put seven days in. Mm. And that seven days would allow you to have a conversation That's with. What's in the, in the um, non-league system in the men's, okay, That's crazy. So it's the same, seven yeah. days. So you get seven days and you get to speak. And yeah, there was a team in, in Norway that had, after we'd played them in Europe and they'd knocked us out. They rang our manager at Everton. Everton manager would ring me, so-and-so is coming for you. And I'd be like, the low ego I'm talking about. Right. Nope, just tell them I don't want to talk. <laughs> and I just closed the, the door off and it was a Swedish team as well. But I got the opportunity um, when I moved, not long when I moved up to Everton to go to America. And it was the time where I'd just come out of the hostel. So I was living in a hostel, moved to Liverpool and I just bought my first house. And I was so house proud of this little terrace house that yeah, I had in Liverpool. That I was That's like, an achievement. Half of me was like, I'm going. And you know what I did? I did the maddest thing. I never told anybody this, right? I signed to a, and I had no agent at the time. I signed to a French agent, right? Oh, wow. And signed a deal to sign for Philadelphia. So I'd signed it all. Yeah. It was all signed. Signed, sealed, whatever. I'm going to Philadelphia to play. Mm. And then I was like, no, I'm not going. <laughs> and I didn't even tell the agent I weren't going. I never, I never answered the calls. I never responded to emails. I never spoke to the Philadelphia coach. I never spoke to any of them. You ghosted everybody. Just ignored them, yeah. <laughs> Because I was not giving up my house. I was like, nah, I can't. Okay. No one stay in my house. From, no, so I was just too house proud. Never told anybody. Just kind of ignored them. Like this thing didn't happen. Like it was like a madness. Like this we hasn't got a happened. snippet right here. And I just literally, I've never, I've never spoken about this. And, I've, and I, I, I never, I never, I was like, no, nah, I can't do it. Mm. And it wasn't even, I think it was like, what was it? What was I getting? Like 60,000 US dollars at the time they'd offered. Don't even know what that, that converted to, but it was more than what I was getting here. Mm. As a as a uh, an F, I was an FA skills coach at the time and not getting paid at Everton, um, but yeah, this was all signed. Like I was going, it was like two thousand nine, ten. I can't remember what year it was around that time. So you basically Absolute. had a job as well as playing football, right? Yeah. So it was madness that I'd even signed it, and, and I'd never met this agent. The club had contacted an agent to contact as me to do, sign yeah. all the papers. Right. How I mean, did you get out of that? I just didn't. I just didn't speak to anybody. Just didn't and happen. it was only a one year contract with the agent, so he never contacted me after. Okay. Didn't, I've never met the guy. Wow. Never met him. Literally, could yeah. I don't even know. How, I don't know how I got out of that. It just didn't happen. Didn't you go. But what happened? They, so off. basically, they'd held my rights then for two years. Oh, right. So you couldn't go and play in America because mm. I'd basically signed them and obviously ended up not going. Um, Do you look back at yeah. maybe a missed opportunity or are you okay with that? No, I'm okay with not going. I uh, when I I don't regret anything. It was just when I signed for Liverpool and I'd never played with foreign players or overseas mm. players in in. in ever before and when I signed for Liverpool they'd signed quite a few we had, we had a couple of uh, we had a German a Swedish a um, couple of Americans an Icelandic and then just playing with them and training with them this is when we went semi-pro this is why I left Everton to Liverpool we went semi-pro you know that training mentality mm. is different compared to English people completely different and that was when I was like hmm I wish I'd have gone aboard okay. just to get that, just like, that just to up. that kind of like, even that appreciation of your teammates. Because mm. when you're playing constantly and you have a, you have an expectation and a, and a standard in yourself. A new right? challenge. And, and what happens is that when you do, when you, when you have that, you expect that of the next person. Mm. And what you don't, or I wasn't skilled enough to have an appreciation for their levels mm. and their standards. And I didn't want to know about it because I just wanted you to be and understand mm. my levels and my standards. Okay. So you talk in a certain way and communicate in a certain way with your teammates. Mm. And in England, we're like, you know, how we'd been brought up under Hope Power England and, and Mo Marley Everton was like, you're just ruthless, you're just direct and you just basically set how it is, right? No but that tact. don't work for everybody. Yeah, of course. And it doesn't get the best out of everybody. Mm. And that was how I would always communicate in that way and always expect to be communicated with. Okay. And then it wasn't until, as I said, I went to Liverpool, the manager, the players that I was with, complete opposite the manager would put his arm around me telling me I'm the best players ever coached and all of a sudden I'm like I've never been told that before mm. 
Because the expectation that. of the coaches I worked before was always to tell me I weren't good enough to try and drive yeah. me that way. Yeah. And you had players that, you know, I made a mistake. And like, they always, they would they always smashed. applaud the intent. Yeah, it's crazy. Like they see that I'm trying to play this, okay, it's been cut out. And they're like, throw it, excellent. Yeah, I can yeah. see what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you're giving this ball away. And because of that little bit of communication, like, I'm, I'm trying to win it back. Mm. Whereas in England, I was so used to like, communicate, as I say, in, in, in only one way. Yeah. That it was only until I'd played with those players and then obviously we managed under the manager I had at the time at Beard, I had a completely different outlook on it and appreciation for other people. Matt rather Beard. than yeah, Matt Beard. Oh, okay. And yeah. It, yeah. And um I, I, I mean we got on really well. But I'm just mean in terms of like the way that he would tell me how good I was. I'd never mm. been told that before. I knew I was good. You know you're good. Yeah, of course. I'm not, you're not you're not stupid, you wouldn't be at the level you are. So he was he was manager but, of West Ham as well, wasn't he? Yeah. See, I I don't know Matt Beard personally, but I came across him. Mm. And I always thought, you know, what is it? Your what's your strength? I think his skill is that. I think his skill is that. that man management. Yeah, his man management skill, and he's got a family. Stuff. And you, you know, as I say, and, and no disrespect to Hope and Mo, is that they they didn't. And even you know, Biddy was at Matt Beard would be like, you know, if you need a couple of days off, you know, with a partner at the time, and yeah. let me know. That you know, I trust free. you enough to. And I'm like, wow, man, this is like Big. I'm allowed a day off. Like, yeah. really. You don't think I'm cheating by doing that. Mm. And that was my mentality before being coached by, by Matt Beard. And, and I do, I think his my management is 100% his strength. Hope and Mo's um, skills were their knowledge and understanding of the mm. game and how they deliver that to you in a way that you then understand it and can deliver that. So yeah. they were very good tactical, you, you know, yeah, coaches. Of and, Everyone's got their strengths and but weaknesses, yeah, haven't but they? But it, so. it was, it was, that, that's the only regret. I felt like I would have been a better teammate in terms of like how I communicated. Um, my intentions were always right I just yeah. wanted to win I wanted the best for all of us but as I say sometimes them communication skills if you haven't got them can be interpreted in different yeah. ways and misconstrued so yeah I mean Jill Scott bless her I mean she must have well she did hate me I get I reckon because <laughs> I used to go mad at, yeah because, yeah I did she paid it paid off yeah. though right I, I, yeah she'll tell you that but yeah I used to and not I lo- Jill was such a good player and mm. somebody that Honestly, you know, like if you're going to war, it's like you need someone that you're taking. You're taking her for okay. every reason, for every for every. You take her in the you, jungle, wouldn't you? You take exactly. <laughs> I knew she was going to win it. As I saw, ah, oh, this girl. She was my roommate. Yeah. But I was harsh on her when she was young, mm. and like Jill was like a Robbie Savage for me. You know, like running everywhere, and I'm a midfielder that is more controlled. Like yeah, likes to read, and she'd run past me and press my play, and I'm like, Jill, stop effing running! Like, what are you doing? She's just got that energy. <laughs> and I, yeah, too much. And I'm like, and I'm like, just, and I'd be screaming. And as I say. If I understood then, when I was younger, because I, I mean, well, I'm three, four years older than Jill. Mm. If I understood those communication skills when I was younger then, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't have been as harsh with her. But, but Listen, we all, all learn from that, bad. and like we've come out the game really good. She, she, Luckily, she got through she, it. This is how much of a good person she is because I won't be her friend now if she nah, communicated to me that way as a kid. Nah. But yeah, we're we're really good friends. See, here, when but, we yeah. look back, there are people like mm. that say because you know we've got different. Uh, stress levels we can handle different things talk mm. about being more resilient people communicate to us in a different way there's people I look back on and I know it was tough love mm. and I'm like you know what that's what did I the knew. right thing yeah, yeah you, that's you know for me that's what worked mm. because that's what I needed if someone gave me an inch I would probably take a mile <laughs> do you know what I mean so you need to yeah. be on top of it yeah. and it's like you spoke earlier about just being honest as a coach or a manager yeah. look you're not for me you're not in a team you're not playing well enough. End of conversation. Mm, mm, Don't mm, be mm. telling me, yeah. go work on this, work on that. That's what you used to, upbringing. It's like, mum, can I have this? No. No yeah. is no. It's like, and you can't, you can't even, there's nothing. It's like, yeah. bye. Okay, can I get a nice, no, I ain't got no money, bye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's that, that's, I'm like black and white. I hate all this kind of grey areas and mm, pussyfooting around everyone to get to, so yeah. Soft, soft, softly approach. But right, 2009, you went close. You know, mm. most cap player for England. Had a fantastic Indian career. So, and I saw you at the Euros, didn't I? It was pitch mm. side. I see you get tackled, fall on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the celebrations. I mean, come on. But they killed me. Uh, you had they your heels on. Oh. Uh, I thought it was a bit stronger than that, but right. you just you stacked it, didn't you? That was a good it. moment. That was the best moment. I mean, the how best. good was it? I oh. mean, I saw you was obviously working, doing the punditry. How good was it to be involved and just to, to see what happened unfold? Yeah. Yeah, like, honestly, they appreciate. I, like I was truly grateful. Like that, be like you. You come out of your career, you know yourself. Like you don't know what opportunities are going to mm. be there. And I had an opportunity to do some coaching alongside doing a bit of punditry with the BBC. And with with that in mind, that the Euros were coming up, and I could be a part of that for the BBC. I was Perfect. like, I have to do that. Like 
you know, cameras aren't for me. Mm. I know I talk a lot quicker than other people. I know I have a good understanding of the game and, yeah. and views of the game. So I knew that part would be good. Mm. I knew that my delivery would need to be worked on. And yeah. I was hoping, you know, a year going into the Euros, I could, you know, by, by being doing WSL with BBC, yeah, that would it. help me build into the Euros. But I did not not want to be a part of, you know, a home Euro. That's where I started my international career at a, a home Euros in 2005. So I was like, this is perfect. And I also knew the team was in a fantastic place to really go and do what they did. Mm. Um, so, yeah, to be a part of it at, at Wembley. And there was no doubt that they were going to win, mm. you, you know, that Euro final with 90,000 behind them, you know. It, the, the best player of Germany, you know, in the warm-up got injured. I'm yeah, like, oh my God, it's all scenes. written. You know, it's this crazy. is happening. And yeah, just to be a part of it and be, you know, and I was grateful that I was pitch side because, you know, then what was stuck up in the studio and yeah. a part of me wanted to be in the studio because yeah. I want to be telling you how I'm feeling. But the pitch side, That's what you I wouldn't need have to changed be. that That's for what anything. You just to be. being there with the players. I'm like, mate, in, in with the celebrations. Yeah, apart from nearly doing my ACL. I know. Good, good job. I got strong knees. It was. It um, was great TV. It was great, man. It was, it was just, great uh, moments. For the girls. It was unbelievable. and for the game. Mm. It, for the game, it, it was. But it wasn't a surprise. It would have been for mm. some, but for me, once they, I thought Spain could have been the hiccup yeah. in the quarterfinal. What once they got past Spain, they was looking strong at once. Yeah, they, they was. I just I thought England have got, away. you know, in in terms of beating them before. Mm. I think the, the French struggle against us at the minute, but I just it was the Spain, uh, the, 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 the Spain game. If there was mm. one game I thought we were going to lose, it was that. And, you know, to get through that game Phenomenal the way we did. And, and, you know, we didn't deserve to win it. Mm. But to get through it, I was like, this is ours. Yeah. This is our game. Yeah. This is our, our tournament and, and it's coming home. Yeah, I saw uh, not only yourself, there was obviously Alex Scott. There was quite a few mm. former players that was doing the punditry. I think, I think the, the television around it was excellent. I went to every England game. Mm. I went to some other games as well up north, which was, was handy to me. And just going into the stadiums, I mean, when you're talking about, um, you know, sexism in football and trying to get over to men, how important it is to support the women's game. The, the vibe, the atmosphere was different. You saw men and families with their daughters. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't show you, you know, how supportive you should be towards women's football, mm. nothing will. Because it's just a totally different vibe going into the games. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. They're, they're, they're totally, and you know what, you, you say that, and we always say, like, I always say to people, to, international tournaments are the best in terms of like going and getting a real feel for the women's mm. game because they do sell out stadiums, they do get the yeah, crowds in that the women's game is deserved, and you know, the, the support throughout the whole tournament, not just for the, for the, for the, the, the lionesses, but for every nation, mm. you know, the games that were going on, the amount of fans that went out, but it's just that it is that family feel that you have, and it's not your, your normal you know, football hooligan is, you know, yeah, fans. You shouldn't be afraid going game, to a football match. Qatar, you know, I don't know if he was out in Qatar. And no. it, was, it, it was the same field. Didn't have the pleasure. And that is what was so nice, is that I actually went to a men's tournament, a game, mm. and going into the game and in the stadium mm. felt like I was at a women's game, apart from what was on the pitch. It was in very open though, yeah, wasn't it? I was very sat in the final and... with the Argentina fans here, French fans just mm. in front, both celebrating, equally celebrating, you know, both goals that were... That, yeah. No fights, Refreshing. no no bad language, you know, no beer being. Fr it was just, yeah, nice, and that is the women's game, and that yeah. is the, the 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 culture of the. So people the can supporters. behave. So they can behave yeah. without alcohol and stupidness yeah. that happens before. So they can, mm. you know, whether you're a female football fan or a male football fan. The mm. World Cup proved that in in Qatar that yeah. it can be, you know, a game for all to go and support and that family type feel. Yeah, one hundred percent. And fans can interact no matter who which team you're supporting, mm. if it's done correctly. And in the right manner. And that's how the women's game has always tried to be. Yeah, of course. And that's how the World Cup for me felt mm. this year in Qatar. So, yeah, but the fans were, were great. And I'm, I'm imagining the World Cup this year to be even bigger in Australia, New Zealand. Going into it as favourites, right? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, rightly so. Mm, Beat USA, I know it was only a friendly, but... I think it'll be difficult. Yeah. I think it'll be difficult. Um, America building, they're in that transition in terms okay. of like the generation that I used to play against that kind of went on a little bit longer. Um, do you know much about the up-and-coming players? Have they got... They've got a couple of youngsters. Don't know, well, you've seen some of them come on at Wembley and they mm. made a difference in, in the game there. So I think they're, they're definitely building. Australia will be good. Yeah. They're a home nation. Um, you know what it's like with a home with a home country. Yeah, the Lioness has proved that. So that extra boost. But the French, the French were good and they had a young squad. They left a lot of big names out in the Euros. Yeah. So I would imagine them... What was that, politics? Yeah. Wow. That make the French Outspoken. association are mad. The way that they left big players out, like, Principal. and it's 
we would never do that in England. Rarely you do really? that in England. So they were principled Unless, we're, get, unless we're getting older, out. you rarely leave it out, yeah. Was they right to leave those players out mm-hmm. then? On, on, I don't know, I don't know was, the ins and outs behind it. Yeah. I don't know what went on um, behind the scenes. But in terms of the ability, were they right to leave them out? Absolutely not. Yeah, if course. you want to go and win, you take your best players. Mm. And they're not players that are disruptive to the squad. They're, it was disruptive just, to the movement. I, I guess. You, Maybe it was as I say, those people that are outspoken, you've seen it with Hegerberg in Norway. Mm. Uh, she missed international for, I think it was about five years and only returned to this Euros in the summer. Yeah, I saw because that. Because she crazy. spoke about the qualities and the well being of players and how mm. they were treated compared to the men. And so yeah. if you're outspoken, you don't, you don't right. get. She's she was right. right. You 100%. are right. And, and you don't get far when you're outspoken because mm. you're thought of as, you know, disruptive and you know, unappreciative and all of these things. And actually you're trying to do the right thing. Mm. Maybe it's not at times comes across in the, in, in, yeah. in the manner in, in which it should, but you're not a bad person for wanting things to be better. These and right. Not even things, better, but right. Yeah, these are some of the things we're trying to unpack, you know, culturally, you know, if we're talking about tackling discrimination. How do we find a space to have that conversation and challenge situations? Because as you said, sometimes people can just, they can counsel you because mm. how dare you speak out? I like to think we're getting to a place and a time where, you know, if we can empower people to be vocal, you know, you've got your own space mm. in the podcast, or I've got a podcast. Let's talk freely. Let's challenge mm. people. Let's put people on blast. Yeah. If we have to, otherwise, it's never going to be said, it's right? True. But it's it's only in these spaces that we can do yeah. it. So your podcast, I've, I've launched mm-hmm. my podcast for that reason. Is yeah. that sometimes you just want to, you don't know the right people to go to, but they'll they'll hear what you're saying mm. for sure. Because when we spoke about on, on my podcast, we spoke about what's going on in America mm. and with the coaches doing whatever they were doing with players and all of that whatever and I was like mate we need to look on our own doorstep about we're looking at you know we're looking yeah, at, at what America's doing because are we sure that ours is so clean because yeah. if we are okay let's comment mm. if we're not so sure let's be quiet or deal with what's in yeah, front of, of us and and I had so many messages after that conversation that you know on the pod and earth I had so many you know is there something you're not telling us blah 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 it's like you lot should know yeah, if you don't on. know then you know so yeah, there's, there's, it's only these spaces now where you can go, let, let's talk. And if people want to listen and, and ask and come and meet, rather than trying to go to people and then, yeah. as you say, and being thought of as this person that is negative or, or disruptive or whatever else. So they're, they're, they're here it, it, it and, needs, and we're, we're the action. It's like, yeah. We can be those people going forward, right? Mm-hmm. We can be. Huh? We can we're be. there now. We are, we are. We worked hard to, to be able to share our opinions and, and give our voices. So it's true. You keep doing your thing. 172 games, right, for England. Do you think that I'll ever be beaten? I thought Jill was going to beat it. I thought she'd uh... So is you glad when she be tired? <laughs> no. No, do you know what? Because I actually, it's mad. I actually thought she had more in her. Mm. Um, but I think she retired. I think she had a few niggles that she were just... She retired on top. Yeah. Got to respect I, I, that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, if I'd ever won an, an international tournament mm. I'd have never played again after that <laughs> you can't and, top it can you and, I and think, that's the thing right and especially maybe at her age she's probably mm. thinking do I have another year where I've got to compete at? she's done it yeah. for so many years to get me to a world cup and, and she and wasn't maybe starting she the games as yeah. well so, so maybe yeah she felt... you kind of fade out a little bit and mm. your age and yeah um, so I thought Jill would I think I, I think it will be beaten for, for the reason that they play so many more international get fixtures now we used to probably on average I mean I was in the England team for 19 and a bit years the, the senior team and that's 172 if you average that I don't know what it is yeah. seven eight games a year yeah. if that yeah. they're playing that in about three or four months no, now I, so, I mean, so in terms of that. like the amount of games and yeah. tournaments they've now I think they, they've introduced the, the, um, what's the what's the cup the men do the international one they do for the men um, Nations League Nations League they've brought that into the women's now okay. or they're bringing it into the women so competitive be far friendlies more, yeah there'll be far more fixtures now mm. in, in international so it will be beaten for sure mm. Um I'm sure Lucy Bonds will want. I don't know what she's on now, but I'm sure she's somebody that, whenever there's a, whenever there's something to be beaten, she will she will beat it. It's, there's a goal. <laughs> there's a sure. goal. But her she game her it. game is based on pace and yeah. getting up and down. She'll, that, she'll right, find that spot, a way. So she'll find a way. She'll have to play centre mid or something. She's the most competitive player I've yeah? ever come across. Yeah, unbelievable player. Um, but yeah, she'll uh, she'll find a way to beat it. Right. <laughs> but you're, you've set the goalposts. Yeah. You're like you're like the Alan Shearer. Like he, he's on he's on match of the day talking about people beating his record, but he doesn't want anyone to beat his record. See, so. I don't think I, I, I don't think Kane will be uh, Kane will beat him. No, no, I, I don't know. I, I said no. Well, he listen for me. Yeah, he's got to move on. There to be broken. He's anyway, got to move on so, though, yeah. right? He's got to stay in the Premier League yeah. for me. Go Man United or mm. whatever. I know he's been linked with other clubs, but to stay at Tottenham is is just fruitless for him. Yeah. You know, to not win anything is crazy. I know. How can Not you go that. through your 
career and not be win as good any as trophies. That and nothing. Yeah, nothing. Huh? It's true. That's a shame. Well, what did it mean for Beth Mead to win sports personality? I mean, it was a clean, clean sweep, wasn't it, for the women? Mm. They won the, they won the, the, the lionesses won the team of the year as well, the manager yeah. of the year. So, I think it's a first, right? I, to be honest, you know, I've watched Sporty for many, many of years, and never ever thought you'd ever see a female footballer taking the the, the, the main prize. Mm. Never. Off the so, back of the Euros, timings, everything. I think the timing of it was was perfect, mm. as you say. There, they just won the Euros. She just got. Um, BBC Player of the Year, so she she was nominated for the Ballon d'Or. She mm. come was it second or third, second I think. So second she come, sorry. So I think off the back of all of the that, and right on top of then, mm. you know the sporty coming up. I think it is it is about timing, and you know if something's happened earlier in the year, it tends to be forgotten. You know, yeah. so there's she was up against some great competitors, but I just think how the, how close it was to her success. Mm probably edged it was still in fresh in the minds of, of people and the voters and yeah of course look it's an, an unbelievable achievement for her and mm. the women's game yeah um, puts us out there puts the women's game out there mm. um, I'm not sure it'll ever happen again if, if I'm sure if, if I'm honest I don't mm. think you'll see a, a female footballer yeah get sporty again but mm. it's great that she got it and, mm. and it was deserved given the achievements 100%. that she had that year and some of the I mean even the mentality of her to even go through what you know we've seen recently the passing of her mum mm. to go through a, a year you know knowing what's going on behind the scenes and a major tournament you know coming away top goal scorer player yeah. of the tournament how you can put that out of your mind and focus on your job in hand how but she we do, don't to we? do that mental yeah we've, we've we all do, done that do. as, as athletes I we think do, but it's so because we know as well right because I know personally yeah. what I've been through in terms of once you once the whistle blows mm. and you're on the pitch, yeah, you, the people in the stadium don't, don't care. Know. It's like you're rubbish, mm. and why aren't you performing? Yeah, yeah. They don't want to hear about any excuses, mm. but you get paid whatever mm. you get paid, so no. they don't want to hear about it. No. So showing that strength, that resilience, that resolve, listen, we get it as yeah, as athletes, as athletes professional you people. Do. Unbelievable, but yeah, it puts. Mm. I mean, not that I mean, I think the lioness has already put the women's game on on the map, but I think she's just mm. lifted that, and yeah, I think it's certainly opened up the eyes of some football fans in general to try and mm. get them to come and support the game. And also um, non-footballing fans. Mm. I think that was what's really important with watching sports personality, the Euros. Yeah. There was non-sporting people getting mm. involved in, I'm going to watch a game. There's a big game tonight. Yeah, yeah. Who's playing? Lioness is like, wow, okay. Yeah, that the, builds the audience, right? I used Put to go to them games and pay like five pound to watch. Okay. You and know? now it's... And, and I remember we used to seat. go there. There was four of us. I've got two brothers and a sister. Mm. And we used to go for a five or eight. My uncle would take us that a week £20 is, you know, affordable. Mm. And that's pretty much what the women's game's been. You know, yeah. to go to a match is five, six pounds. I think 12 at most. Mm. At some point, that's going to have to change like it did in the men's game. And I remember it going, it, it, it went from £5 to £40. You know, £40 for kids and I thought, okay, £200 a week to £20 a week. We're not going. And we yeah, ended up not mad. being able to go and watch Chelsea because it was just not affordable. That's mad. And the women's game will have to at some point, mm. changes ticket prices. Yeah. And as you mentioned there about, you know, it's a family environment yeah. at the minute. Okay. Family ticket's going to be yeah. X amount. It, it's going to change. Yeah. It's going to have to change. Yeah. And is it going to, are you going to attract the same sort of fan base? How mm. is the fan base you've built already going to feel about mm. that? So there's going to be so They've got to get that balance because I think the biggest fear with TV is that obviously you want to see full stadia. So if you outprice, people are not going to turn up, but you want to make sure you get that balance, right? You want to see... Mm -hmm maybe smaller stadiums. It's great seeing um, the women play on the main stadium, yeah. on the main pitch. So the yeah, Emirates is like 35,000 mm -hmm. and like Old Trafford. Do you know what I mean? But I had this with Rio. It's still tough, right? Before, you still yeah. you play in a smaller stadium and have it full as opposed to playing I'm glad on you that. said that. I was at Rio before the Euros, me and Rio Ferdinand, we was doing a, we was together doing, I can't remember what he was doing, something for mm. William Hill now. And we got asked that question. I said, because there was a question around, were the stadiums, because some of the international teams were complaining yeah. That the stadiums they were playing in, yeah, playing um, in the smaller stadiums, smaller stadiums, so twelve seater, twelve thousand seater. The FA actually got and that I, right, perfect. The size and I right. said to them, I said to Rio, "Have you ever walked out in a stadium eighty thousand and there's five thousand fans there? <laughs> let me tell you, they might as well not be there. Yeah, exactly, it's dead. because it's not motivating one bit. Yeah. I would rather walk out in a field, a, a field eighty thousand seat stadium, mm. and feel that atmosphere and be like, yeah, like this is everybody's here for us, of kind course, of thing. 100%. And it looks busy, even though we know it's eight thousand, but mate." It is full. Yeah. And he was laughing at me, but I'm like, you've never had to do that to no. know the difference in, in how it feels as a player and that what, what then will drive you and motivate you. 
I had that when I was but, playing for Notts County. They had 20,000 seat of stadium and pff, they were getting six or 7,000 people watching them play. And it's like, great stadium, but dead uh, atmosphere. Mm. And if you're on a away team, it's like, oh, it's a nice day out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. for a home team, so yeah, play in a smaller stadium, mm-hmm. fill it and get that, yeah. get that atmosphere 100%. 100% have to. All right. So talking about transition for, for players and yourself, obviously going from playing, that's why I asked it, we kind of alluded to it. You know, is there enough pathways for players to go into coaching or punditry? I mean, look at the men's game. I know we're not going to compare the two, mm. but I know the FA have been keen, not to fast track, but to work with international players like Lampard, Gerard, whoever it may be. If Rio wanted to be a coach, I'm mm. sure he could be a coach. To ensure that there's some sort of pathway for them to come back into the game. Is enough happening in the women's game? You know, somebody like yourself, 172 games. Did, they, did anybody say to you at some stage, you know what, well, we've got a pathway mapped out for you if you wanted to be a coach or manager? No. Never. I mean, no, they, they didn't. And I, I was actually quite, I was lucky in terms of, I was on a diversity call, mm. Zoom call at the FA and Hope Powell at the time had asked me, would I come on, on it? Because I understood in terms of where I grew up, it was multicultural estate. Mm. I understood body language of a, a Caribbean person or yeah. an African person in terms of tone of an African yeah. person is different to tone of a, a white British person. Mm-hmm. And so she kind of wanted to get me on this diversity call to see it from a white person's perspective that has grown up around those different cultures. Mm. And actually by being on that call at the time, I was then asked, because they were doing it to try and put placement coaches on to help uh, with the women. To, so it was Rachel Yankee on the time, Mary Phillips. I can't remember. There was one other, one other lady. I can't remember her name now. She didn't play, but she was coaching the game. Okay. Um, and basically, they was trying to get them to work with the younger international teams as a as a coach and observer. Yeah. Um, and then I got asked, you know, because I was on that call, well, would you like to be involved? And of course, I was like, yeah, like international, I'd love to. And I love coaching. It was mm-hmm. what I wanted to do. So I kind of fell into that because Hope asked me to be on a call. So it wasn't like they were helping any of us. And bearing in mind, Mary Phillips has probably been retired out of the game by this point for 10 years now. Mm. Rachel Yankee, probably five, five years since yeah, this call. So, you know, in that five, 10 year period, what have they done for them? Nothing. Mm. It was just hope, power, an idea like, look, we don't help. We haven't got enough diverse coaches mm. to help with, because obviously the game went from when Hope was in charge in terms of the, the, the amount of black players that we had within our squad. Compared to you look at the Euros, there wasn't one yeah. starting player. And there was kind of that conversation around, are we doing enough? Mm. And look, you have to be good enough, regardless of colour, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to be good enough. But we was asked, Hope was asking the question, is enough being done since she left her role to engage these people? And, mm. and I think it was like, no, and how do we get them engaged? So I think that was a difficulty. But again, it, I was on it because of that. But then when you go away, you still, there's no players that look like Yankee, Rachel Yankee or Mary Phillips. Mm. So the whole of the under 18, for example, 17s are, are, are white people. Mm. And so you, it, it's great that then you're giving them the opportunity so that players of different ethnicities can see that, you know, mm. see it, believe it type thing. But then there was none because no. we hadn't already gone into the, the groundwork before that hadn't gone into that for them not to look and feel mm. like that. So there was no no support. We didn't do our coaching badges whilst playing. Um, I, <clears throat> I started my A licence when I retired or coming towards them with the Welsh FA so I started it with a Welsh FA and it was going to be like £7,000 for this A licence course which is expensive Why I don't have Welsh that sort FA? of money I already know the answer but I think I do no I just the English FA didn't ask me you have to be invited onto these courses so the Welsh FA had, had asked me yeah. did I want to come in it and I'm like great you know the difficult thing would have been putting a Welsh kit on for sure <laughs> you know being a proud English person mm. but I was on this course and then the FA got wind if I was on yeah, this FA, the Welsh, the Welsh FA. FA A license. What's that all about? What does that look like for, you know, the most the most capped England player? All of a sudden, yep. we need to show some support. So they get wind of this. Yep. Oh, we're paid for Farah to do. You know, we get mm-hmm. her on the A license here, and we're supporting and blah blah blah. Now, paying for someone to be on something isn't helping them mm-hmm. financially. It's helping me great, but then that support around that, I actually felt there was more support around the Welsh FA yeah. in terms of being on that and the people that I was working with than there was okay. around the English one. And then, because I'm on the, so I just spoke to you about being on that um, placement. So now I'm doing my A license and on a placement course with the FA. So I jumped, I I thanked the Welsh FA, thanks. I'm going to do it with the English FA. They're going to pay for me, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Better suited because I can work alongside it. Okay, so because I was working, I was missing some of the A license. Mm. And so the the, the, Mo Marley was like, you know, but they should understand because it's both FA that they didn't understand. 
So I do half of the A license and I don't get to complete it. So now I'm, I have a, a half of an A license where it's not been completed and there's not been that much understanding between the two mm. and the communication was really poor. Mm. So then it was like, right, that year had gone. I've wasted a year. You know, I've wasted a year trying to do my A, trying to do this coaching. And then I got asked to do them both again. And I was like, and then obviously I got ill. So that's a whole different story. But I was like, one of them have to give. Mm. And I didn't really, and, and, I, and I felt the giving would have to be the coaching because in terms of then, actually, I needed the qualification to coach. I'd coach my whole career, but you need the qualification to tick a box, right? Yeah. Doesn't matter what so your, your knowledge is. Scenario. Yeah. And you need to be working yeah. maybe to be on a coach. So I was thinking, okay, so I could waste a year or gain a year in experience mm. in, in being on the grass with the, with the under 23 England team. And I'd probably get more out of it in terms of I'm on the grass, I can deliver, I can make mistakes, I can learn. But I do a year there and I don't get another placement after that because it's only a one year placement. Mm. I now don't have the qualification to go and apply for a job. So I had to say to them, well, actually, I need the qualification. So I can't take this placement up. Mm. I need to go and get my A license so that in a year's time when I qualify, if jobs do come up, I now have the qualification, even though I don't have the experience, yeah. to go yeah. and apply for jobs. So it's, for me, the PFA, the FA, in terms of support for that transition, when I was a player, I don't know what it's like now, mm. was not there. Yeah. There was talk of it. There was talk. Of, I, I, I give the PFA this in terms of helping with courses. I think their course scheme is very good yeah. uh, for players to go on. But in terms of any other sport uh, support, mm. FA and PFA, I don't think it's there for the women. It might have changed. I've been yeah. retired two years. It might have changed. But certainly when I was a player and, and post-retirement, in terms of that support from either of them, mm. not been there. I think what was important, so when I first saw you, probably seven years, well, when you was at Arsenal, mm. when I came into the club, you know, I felt it was important to engage, you know, visibly stand in front of the women players mm. and, and explain what the PFA can do and support and offer with. And that wasn't happening before. Not mm. nearly enough people were going in to speak to the women about, you know, what's available, what you can access. Because if you don't know, you're not going to tap into mm -hmm. it, are you? So when yeah. somebody says, you know, be a PFA member, what, well, what does that actually mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, is it going to cost me money? So, you know, I saw you that day. I remember the, the, the interaction. We had a little chat and it was mm. good. And also what came across is, you're a student of football. Mm. So you know a bit about football. You know a bit about myself and this, that and the other. And not many players, like when you left the game, you're probably finding this now. A couple of years outside the game, mm. whatever. People don't know who you are anymore. Mm. Young players are like, <laughs> <laughs> like, who are you? They, yeah. don't, they, they ain't got a clue who you are. So I think it's refreshing. But the, the point I'm making is, I think if you're going to do stuff to support players and help that transition, you need to tap into them early. You need to speak to them as, as often as possible. Mm. You can help with that. You know, it's about the pitfalls. I think it's really important to mentor young players and ensure that they're getting that real, that real talk. You know, we're not mm. going to fluff it. We're going to say it's going to be hard. Whoever told you football yeah. or whatever, it's going to be easy. But more importantly, try and avoid some of the mistakes that we yeah. made, some of the pitfalls. There's it's no hard excuse though, isn't it? if you because make the same mistakes. Because all you want to do is be a footballer. Mm. When you're playing, all you your priority is, I'm a footballer. Mm. You don't care about it. Sometimes you don't even care about your partners at the time. You're yeah. like, because you are just solely focused on being selfish around yeah. your career. And people will tap in, as you say, oh, we've got this opportunity. Mm. You know, you can think about these kind of courses. No one sits you down and be like, you know what? You've probably got five years max left of your career. We need to start mm. mapping out, you know, what next for you. Really? That needs to start happening. I mean, yeah, from day one. From, day, from, from early. Scholars. It should have happened from when you were younger yeah. in terms of keeping younger players in education, which now they're not going to, they used to have that at the FA, mm. uh, an education where they do a two year uh, course, football alongside yeah, it. it. But since the game's gone professional, you're signing players at 16, 17 now. So who are turning full time pro. So education for them, they don't care. See, that's a problem. They're going to go me. for their career now. With the women's game, I've had this conversation before in terms of education. So in the men's game, you've got the two year scholarship, which is football and an education mm. provided by LFE in the Premier League. So in the WSL, 16 to 18, there's no full-time yeah. professional educational program. Mm -hmm. You're basically going on to college and you're playing in the first team or whatever club. Mm -hmm. Now, that for me is a bit of an issue, a bit of a problem because you're not paying that player enough. They don't They're get doing paid. No education. Well, don't get paid. There you go. So you get expenses if, not, not if even, you're lucky. Not even. Some clubs they don't. I remember at Red Light. And it's this a is liberty. No, this is nothing to Reading. This is no disrespect to Reading because I actually... They, you have what you have. You have a mm. budget. That's it. Yeah. I've got what they've got. What they've got. They can't get it from somewhere else. Mm. And we had like college players or the under twenty three players coming to train. They wouldn't get transport provided. Wow. They wouldn't have food provided. Like they're just expected to turn up. You'd have players that are on non contracts that would be in a squad of a weekend. You travel up to Liverpool 
The kids are sitting on the coach. Mm. They ain't got no money to go into services and buy service food. Mm. It's double the price for sure for, for already. You really know that. That's crazy. And then you'd offer them something. I'd be like, Mate, like use one anything, and they don't. So you just bring back whatever sweets and whatever mm. food because that's where they feel they're not going to say they want something. They're not yeah. going to tell you they're not getting off because they ain't got no money mm. when that's the reality. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure at other clubs it might be different. Some it will be exactly the same. Mm. But they don't expense them. Even wow. at Reading now in terms of like you have to pay for your food. And I know look, the men's game is different. I know it's in most of the men's contract that it automatically comes out of your, your salary for your mm. food per day. The wins you have to pay for. Mm. Now then that becomes a choice. If you're on a play, if you're a player that's on a low income yeah. in terms of salary, and then you're thinking I have to fork out £150 a month, you're thinking, £150, can I make my food cheaper by buying my own food per week? Blah, blah, blah. Mm. You ain't gonna invest in it. But then you've got to be thinking about food preparation and all it's yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Like the game is so far from being professional. Yeah. And it's those small things that you talk about there that literally those frustrate the details. life out of me. They don't support young players. They don't in whether it be financially, whether it be mentally, whether it be education, mm. there's no support. Not enough. And no one wants to go and ask the questions, what are you doing? No one wants to challenge clubs, what are you doing? It's just run their own way. And that is why I still believe players would rather be in an international environment than their club environment because it's run better. Yeah. It's more professional at England because they have everything, yeah. all the resources needed. Mm. But and then there's they probably don't the top. And I'm talking top clubs. Yeah. There's some top clubs where the well-being is shocking. Yeah. And these top players that are international want to play for the Lionesses, prefer to be in that camp right. than they do back at their clubs because they're not going to get the same well-being treatment. But that's where our game's at. And it's you know what? It's slipping away as well to the point that when the takeover comes, whether it be end of this season or whatever, Pray for our game, guys. <laughs> Pray for the women's game. Because it's, it, it, well-being is key for me. Yeah. We talk it, we don't act it. Mm. I told you, I told you before about Earth is Feeling. Don't mm. tell me, show me. These people that want to be advocates for the well-being of their players, but then put their players in positions where they're not actually showing any sort of well-being attitudes towards them. If it's you're crazy. not looking after a player when they're under your stewardship, you know, not in your club, which is not happening, you know you're not looking after them when they leave the game. Yeah. No. As we know, you know related yeah. to the But that's another earlier. thing, you know, recently the, the PFA have, you know, got some of the girls together. Kate Chapman's tried to get a group of mm. female players to come together and give feedback on the transition and the difficulties and whatever mm. to help. Let me put it in there, to help the next generation of players. Yeah. Okay. But actually, you've got 15, 20 women in that group that are mm. currently struggling, mm. that currently have lost their identity, that are currently can't afford to pay for therapy. Yeah. So it's great that you want to help the next generation that are coming, but what are you currently doing? Like for somebody like me, I've been fortunate. I was lucky. You know, I rolled into, a, a, I fell into the, the, a role at the BBC. Mm. But if I didn't, what would I be doing? Mm. Okay, I'd, I'd be on a coaching path. But even with that, financially then, you're in mm. a position where you've more than, you know, half of your salary is gone in terms of half of your income mm. as a player to then be trying to become a coach has gone. Mm. So affordably, can I afford to then pay for the property that I'm, I'm in. So there's no consideration for the current crop of players mm. that have retired from the game. These players that are professional, they'll be getting better advice. They'll be earning a lot more money. So for now, until they retire, the advice they'd be getting, I would imagine, would be a lot better so that when they're retired, they're better equipped. They need to focus on these players that you're trying to get in now and get this feedback off mm. that you've given no support to at yeah. all. But that's just my my opinion of it. I'm I'm happy to to give my feedback and be like, yeah, this needs to be better. But what about us? Yeah. What about us that you know, we were employed at a club and private healthcare, etc. You get mm. a salary, you get looked after, fed, you know, and then you retire, and all of a sudden you're NHS and 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 that's normal because the everyday person is on yeah. the NHS and have to go through that. But I just think in terms of that, it's it's shocking. And then well, players we, really we can follow this that. conversation up if, yeah. you, if you're okay to do For that. Sure. You trust me enough, right? I do. So, I do. so we can follow that conversation <laughs> up, yeah? yeah? Yeah. All right. So, Farah, what about um, so when I watch football now, there's more visibility. I see more women pundits and commentators. I see yourself on BBC, match of the day. Mm. I mean, <laughs> wow, times have changed. Refreshing, you know, I look forward to it. But what about what about the negative backlash, the sexism? Because I have conversations with men all the time about oh, you know, there's a woman pundit. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Mm. Why do I have to see it? Like, <laughs> mate, you know, they've played the game. Did you play the game? No, I didn't play the game. Um, do you know anything about systems and formations? 
well, not really. So mm. maybe that's why they're there, knowledgeable. So how do you deal with the, the negativity, you know, and how do you just plough through? Mm. I mean, I think what helps is my, my upbringing in terms of always having to show that resilience. So I think that certainly helps me. The, the, the people I grew up around and mainly around men <clears throat> who, for me, treated me as one of them. So I wasn't seen as a, a female, you know, when I was growing up. It was like, nah, she's one of the lads type thing. Mm. So I kind of get that. And, and I'm quite good at not reading and listening to, to crap that's put on Twitter and social media, which is a difficult thing I know for females because they want to read all what the feedback is. they get because we're so used to as footballers, <clears throat> when you play a game or whatever, you get feedback. You want that feedback. You look for that. Um, I'm somebody that I don't really, in terms of my punditry, don't look at social media to get that feedback from. Good. I have good people around me that are honest with me in terms of, you know, when I'm on, you know, my agent, I'm saying agent, he's one of my really good pals who grew up from when we mm. was on the estate. So he's honest. He's like, Farah, your delivery was too fast. Farah, your delivery was, mm. you know, it was really good there when you slowed down your speaking and yeah. that insight there, <clears throat> you need to do more of that. So <clears throat> in terms of the people I have around me that give me feedback, they don't feed me with stuff that they think I need to hear. They're yeah. honest, they're brutal. If I watch that back, it weren't good enough. Mm. Have a look at what weren't good. And then when I'm good, this is what you need to get some consistency with. Mm. But it's difficult. You know, you sit there on a panel and you're, you're with guys that, for example, can make a mistake, huge mistake. And they say stuff and they mess up. Men are good. They're really witty. That's what I know in terms of like, you guys are so witty compared to females. And what you're very good at is when you make a mistake is laughing at I it. Do. And, and getting over it, right? Yeah, and, and as if it didn't happen. Yeah. Women, we make a mistake and you all of a sudden you see the face go, ooh, yeah. I've made a mistake. How do I cover it? You lose your trail of thought mm. and all of a sudden the viewers can see what you're doing. And that's yeah. what we're not so good at. Mm. But it's difficult because you're right, we've played the game for many years in terms of that understanding of the game, tactics and all of that. It's the same. We yeah, know it and we can give feedback on it. And it, it, it is difficult. I, I tell you what is difficult is that we don't have those experiences that guys do. So we're at a disadvantage going into the men's game and talking about men's football. Mm. I haven't felt the men's dressing room. I haven't played in front of 80,000 a week. So those type of, you know, insights I don't have as a female pundit. And I accept that I don't have that. But what I can do is I can fall back on my own experiences as a footballer on the pitch. And they're not, they're not as different. You know, I still sit in a changing room with females. We still have, you know, the same sort of nervous energy around you. Of course. You know, and all of those things that you can you mm. can feed on and, and, and share with the audience. So I try and not put myself as if I played the men's game. I talk about it and always relate to, to what I experience, which I know mm. will be completely different to the men's game. But yeah. in terms of when I'm watching on the pitch, it should be the same and I should be judged on what I'm actually saying about the game. Exactly. And not anything else around it. And I think that's what I, I struggle with a little bit. Because they don't just look at what you're saying about the game of football. Mm. They try and think about everything else around that. And yeah. it's completely different. But it's, it is difficult. And we're always going to get, you know, what are these females doing in our game? For mm. sure we're going to. Yeah. And, and, and I do get it. But as I said, if they listen to the, the actual detail and the content and what you're saying, then they might have a, a better respect level for some of the females that are out there giving great insights into the game. 100%. And I'm hoping, listen, the, the vast majority of men listen to my podcast Hopefully they're going to learn something and listen to it. And... I might get a Forest fan. Come on. Back me, guys. Be I do a lot of Forest. Fans. I've done a few Forest games this yeah. year as well. Right. When they bloody drew a Chelsea, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hate. <laughs> but no, the point I'm making is it, it's, it's, all, and it's all an education. And, you know, I've learned, so I've got a better understanding. You know, I've got a wife, two daughters. Mm. So maybe I've got more understanding around, you know, how to treat women mm. and, and to be, you know, more inclusive and this and the other. But, these conversations need to be had. And, you know, we spoke before about maybe tokenism in terms of maybe people think that women are just being given an opportunity to go and do TV and punditry because of quotas. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, we do need those quotas. Mm -hmm. So we do need to see Definitely. more numbers. So we need to drive them up. But the people that are getting those opportunities have got the skill sets and have got mm -hmm. the qualifications. Now, judge them on their performance and what they can do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that will enable others to follow and come through. And you've... You know, you've done there, won a t-shirt, you've played in these tournaments and you've done the work. And what I do see with yourself and others is you come in and you're prepared, mm. you know, as you was as a player. So mm. you should get pops for that. Yeah. You know, 100%. So never feel that 
You know, you go. That's on difficult. There and... You're right, though. Women going into the men's game in mm. punditry, you have to do double the work. And I'm sure Wrighty would tell you the same. You're mm. right. When he does the women's, he probably has yeah. to do double the work. Yeah. You don't just come into it blind and think, well, I've got enough based off my, you know, my footballing career and you know, in the men's game, mm. he has to go and do his research on the women. Likewise, we do. Of course, we watched it as fans. Yeah. Watching the men's game as a fan is completely different. Now, I was going to work on it mm. and being a pundit in those games, completely, completely different. Yeah. And uh, you you got to take that fan aspect out of it. Now this is my job. I've got to make sure that I'm, you know, fully prepared and equipped for all of these players. Because but let's be honest, when I watch the Premier League, I don't watch, rarely do I watch outside of the, the, the top six or mm. used to as a fan because you don't want to watch outside the top. You want to watch your own team mm. more often than not all the big games. Yeah. So you've got to, when you're going to do the, the lower teams down in the Premier League, mm. mate, if you don't know anything about them, you're going to be exposed. And more often than not as a female, you don't get the big games. You get the teams that are lower down the league yeah. because no one wants to do them. Yeah. No, not disrespectfully, but you ain't going to get. You, you know, you got, for example, I don't, I'm trying to think. Use right, I love right. If there's an Arsenal against Man United game, mm. or there's a a Forest against Leicester game, mm. right, he's going to do the Arsenal. You know, yeah, I'll be going Forest, Leicester, whatever it is. Big, big, game and it's difficult Forest. because then you don't watch them as much. You've just been promoted. <laughs> don't alienate so you yourself. Probably, Forest no, I'm just Leicester. saying. Yeah, I'm but I'm just saying you've just been promoted so now I've got to do all my research around you know, how did you get on in championship what was just yeah. I can help you with that you know, you and, you know the lonies then got so, and then you've got 21 new and, and all yeah, of it of you've got to do your research yeah. so you do have to make sure you're you're more prepared whereas mm. in the women's so if I do WSL yeah. you're a little bit less prepared not less prepared no you've got, you've got that library you have that library of, yeah you've got all of that yeah. I've got that knowledge experience of being in the mm. game and kind of that know-how yeah. and that's what you see when you sit alongside some of the, the male pundits but for me I always what I try and do is when I work with the guys and write is great for me. Rio's really, really mm. good and we get more tap into them. Yeah, As females, the, the best way and for us to versa. learn is for us to tap in and be like, what was that like? Oh, what's he like? Mm. To get some sort of insight. Of course. Because otherwise, the gap becomes even bigger mm. in terms of that transition to try and do some of the men's games. Yeah. You, have to, you have to get an appreciation of, of, of what's it like and I try and where I can mm. is get as much extra knowledge um, through the, the guys that I'm working with and, and, and they're great. I do the same, you know, mm. listen, I'm not going to come on here and speak to you today and not know anything about mm. you and that, do the preparation, you know what I mean? So whenever I'm, you know, in the company of women mm. or involved in a game, go and do the work, yeah. you know, don't be ignorant or, or have an ego and think I can just go in because I played the game. Yeah, yeah. You know, I understand it's a different, different concept and I need to have a better understanding of, you know, what goes on behind in terms of women's oh. football and sharing that knowledge with us to as many, as many people as possible mm. because... When, when men are in the pub and they're talking about football, it's embarrassing. It's Honestly, funny. you're listening thinking, yeah. come on, man. If you could hear yourself, like, it's seriously. Funny. I know. Love it. I yeah. love it, though. But you know what? That's what's so good about the game, whether it's somebody Everyone's talking crap in, in, in the pub or whatever, or somebody having an opinion. And I think that's where I probably don't hold on to so much of the criticism is that we all, the, the game is there to have an opinion. Mm. There's a line. And I think it's when the line's crossed. Yeah that's when there's a problem. Yeah. I think having an opinion on whether you think what I'm saying is right or wrong or whether you have a different view, yeah. that's perfect. Give me that but feedback. I don't agree. But there's a line that if you go below, mm. that's where I think the, the problem is. And, you, you know, I've seen loads of female pundits that have been, that mm. line has been way overstepped yeah. with no, no consequence to any of these people are talking about other warriors. stuff, appearance yeah. and whatever it may be. Yeah. It's got nothing to nothing do with to it. Nothing to do with what they're saying. Mm. You can disagree with somebody. That's absolutely fine. That's the game. That's sport. Yeah, Not just football. That's Eat life <laughs> you know oh. you might like a house as something that I'm like oh I wouldn't live in that but I want to live in that and who cares that's your preference listen you keep going from strength to strength I'm sure people are going to have to just deal with it and, and, and <laughs> listen to you and, and watch you hopefully <laughs> and, and appreciate you know what it is you're offering to, to the world of football let's talk about um, is it boots, boots balls, balls and bras, bras. okay let's talk about that <laughs> podcast I mean I've seen I've seen mm. it um, I know Urfa I don't know Bex but you know, what you know, what what was the concept? What made you start that and, and how's it going? Yeah. So I've always wanted to do a podcast just so I can give my own opinion without <clears throat> it, not, I'm saying any judgment. Let me let me rephrase that. You work for the BBC mm. and I'm giving feedback on a game, for example. I have to understand the audience that are watching from the BBC, you know, and some of the language I use and how I deliver some of the stuff that I'm delivering. Mm. But there'll be stuff that, for example, in some of the games that I'm watching, I'm like, I need to talk about this on a different level. I need to talk about this with an open opinion, a yeah. view, 
Um, Not attributed to an yeah. organisation, I understand. And, and, and where I don't have to be careful about the viewer. Mm. Um, and I think there's there's stuff in the game that is not spoken about and people pussyfoot around it and don't really want to go into it or don't really want to scratch the surface because they're scared of the consequence or what might happen, the repercussions or whatever. But there's, in order for our game, I believe, to, to progress in the, in the way that it should and become more professional, there's some things that need to be aired for the right people to listen. Mm. And if they want to know more, can get in contact rather than always being that one that yeah. sees things, goes directly to people, mm. and then I'm looked at as in, you're a troublemaker, you're a bad person. Mm. So I just, on it to say what I want to say, um, that kind of, and as I say, if there's a listener out there that wants a little bit more on it, mm. you can come to me. But it, it's a progressive thing. I'm not quite happy with where the, the, the pods are and how I want it to, to, to feel and look. Okay. Um, and we have constantly, you know, we're constantly trying to review and make it better. Mm. Um, yeah, I just want, though, I right? want to, I want to give that feedback. That's a good thing to do though, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how as a player, how do I always, mm. you know, how can I gain that 1% and I'm still trying to do that with a pod. It needs to be better. Uh, we know that for sure and we want it to be more of that. I was just saying before, come on here, that, you know, finish a game on the back of the bus and we just chat mm. and people are just listening to us chat. Mm. I don't want no, uh, you know, we're having to cut and edit and, and it become unnatural. I just want it to be real mm. life. Whatever happening is said in, in the moment, you're, you're here. And then obviously when we bring people in like you've got me in today is that just don't ask the things that people already know, like really, really try and tap into my, yeah, my thoughts on certain topics. Mm. Um, and I think that needs to get better because sometimes we're scared, especially in the women's game, to ask some of the females mm. stuff they've never been asked. So we ask them stuff that they've already been asked and you already know it's going to be yeah, a scripted of answer. Of course. Um, so, yeah, it's really well, trying to just get to some do that. What do you think? Have yeah, I no, I like it. That's why I just sit back yeah. and chill. This is how I want it to be. Just, you know, yeah. arms on the, on the couch. I come yeah. at home. I'm going to put my feet up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's more of the direction. But mm. it's a learning thing and I'm enjoying doing it. I look mm. forward to doing it every week. Um, and that's the main thing. You'll have to come on. Yeah, I'd love to, to come, come on. on. You'd have to I'd come on. I'd love to come on. Yeah. I just, I, you know, allyship is a big thing, mm. I think, in terms of men men and women yeah. speaking out on various subjects and just, you know, educating the audience. Or tapping to your PFA head. You can always do that. <laughs> Earth is always wanting to do that. <laughs> Listen, you know that, that yeah. I, I sit with Earth on the FA Women's Board. Okay, yeah. You know, did you not know that? I didn't know you were on it as well. I knew she yeah. was on it, yeah. See, she so we've got a lot to talk she about. Get, we do. She comes I've, back I've so... been on there longer than Earth. Earth is a newbie. I've yeah, been on there new. close to six years. So in terms of allyship, mm. um, I've been pushing work. behind the scenes, honestly, fighting this mm. fight for the women's game. For years. And getting extremely frustrated. And that's going to bring me on to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Yeah. So, you know, when... West Brom are praised, you know, for making changes to to the shorts in terms of, yeah. you know, period wear mm. and this, that and the other. I find it mind-boggling, like little things like that, that, you know, Arsenal playing white shorts mm-hmm. and whatever it may be. Are we not really thinking about it? Like, mm-hmm. How is it? Who makes these decisions? It clearly can't be, yeah. it can't be um, women making these decisions, right? Honestly, I, no, I don't know who it is. Because I used to say that in England. I mean... We, the, the England kit, the white, white, white. And mm. we used to have white, blue, white. And I'm like, mate, You're because you know what? When you talk about, it's all right them, you know, in sport and they go, we'll try and give everybody that 1% extra. Mm. So we'll make sure they, they're fueled or we'll make sure they get the right sleep or they've got the right compression tights or, or whatever it might be. We'll give them these, you know, extra vitamins and caffeine, mm. this, that and the other. Like they're all the little 1%. But let me tell you, when it's time of the month for a female and you're going into a game mm. with white kit, white shorts, all of those percentages mm. aren't worth anything because the paranoia that's in your head mm. around something potentially happening yeah. is far greater than those little 1% that you're trying to give them. That, that is just, they're not even thought about. Because yeah. even time of the month, I ain't taking my tablet, I ain't doing that. Mm. I don't care if I'm fueled because I'm just like yeah. worrying about other things that are completely distracting me from Crazy. what I'm supposed to do. It's never considered. Crazy. It's never been considered. Bras, I mean, Nerfa, you, you know, she's hot on bras, sports bras. And this is a conversation we're going to follow up on. She's a, you know, these, these, it's crazy because you just put a sports bra on. There's so many muscles within your boob that need mm-hmm. to be protected correctly in the right sports bra. I mean, they did it for the first time in the Euros. I think Nike gave the women personalized See, that's sports interesting. Bras. I've spoken to a few companies around sports bras, custom-made boots for women. Mm. Or even the boots. Wear. All these, even all the these essential stuff, parts of your kit, part of mm. your, you know, how is it, this yeah. is not the norm. Why yeah. are we having these mm. conversations now? So off the back of the Euros, 
So Chloe Kelly, you know, she takes her top yeah. off and celebrates. She's not got a sports bra because yeah. apparently they wasn't sure if she was going to make the squad or not. The squad, mm -hmm. so she didn't get fitted with a sports mm. bra. I mean, those percentages, the one. I mean, that's crazy, Mad, right? It? That's crazy. Mm, so yeah. it's 80 pound or whatever it may be for a sports bar. They're not cheap. Yeah. So women are They're choosing. They're not cheap. That's the thing. And girls you know, and women are choosing not yeah. to buy them because, yeah. you know, expensive. they can't afford it. So they should sure. be bought for you then. Yeah. So whether it's the PFA, with a, with a voucher, whether it's the FA, mm. this alleviates some of those issues that mm. should be part of your, your workwear. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. crazy, right? It's mad. I used to say that all the time because we used to go away with England. Obviously, there's male staff members mm. and they'd get their pack and they'd have their... their panties and all that you know and they had everything not that I'm asking the FA to give me some pants but the sports bra is a part of our yeah. equipment and sports bars aren't cheap if you're sponsored yeah. then of course you get it for free yeah. but you know there's people with, in the national you go away and you're, you're like small and when you were away sponsored, talk, right? not only that but when we used to be in international we'd go yeah only a small percentage are, are sponsored we'd go on international six weeks I mean they were away for 11 weeks in the US six to eight weeks depending on how far mm. you get in tournament right and we never used to get our kit washed so England never used to wash our kit, as in our, our, our own underwear. So we used to have to bring our own hmm. uh, knickers and our own bra, right? Yeah. That would never get washed. The only okay. thing that would get washed would be your training kit and yeah. your tracksuits and stuff like that. So you think you're going to a six-week tournament, your stuff ain't getting washed. So you either pay for it yourself by the hotel hmm. or you need to buy enough equipment, enough sports bras to get you through that period of time, yeah. that duration. Yeah. Now, if you're sponsored, cool. They'll give you 20, 30 sports bras, you're fine. Hmm. If you're not, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah. It's not a part of the kit and it doesn't get washed. Mm. But it's never considered. And they wonder why there's so many barriers from, from a very young age in terms of that. You even, you even talk about like the, the cost of tampons. Mm. For a young player, if they're going into camp, right? Not so much seniors now because they're getting paid, but I'm thinking back to when you're a young kid and you've got to take like a wash bag. So you've got to get shower gel or you've got to mm. get a sponge or whatever. You've got to get your shampoo, your conditioner, your moisturizer, your shaver, whatever. Tampon. Some of these families can't send their kids away with all this equipment mm. and it's not provided. Yeah. But it's a part of the kit that is needed when you're away from home. At home, you share yeah. one a week with the, the family or whatever it might be. I see the FA learn or, or actually listen and try to put, present a pack for any player that's now coming into the squads at any age group. They get like a welcome pack with some bare essentials in. So mm. I've seen that they've tried to look okay, at it in yeah. that respect, which is good mm. feedback. So you know Urfa, I know Urfa, you know mm -hmm. her personally mm -hmm. very well. We're there to challenge on yeah. the board. So I've been on the board for six years, one of three men. For me, it's been a real learning curve yeah. because I'm listening to stuff and I'm thinking, well, when you talk about people playing lip service to the game, I'm hearing a lot of lip service. So Earth has come on, she's been probably a year. She's now coming in and she's refreshing and she's changing and challenging. And, and that's what you need because, you know, with all due respect, there's people that are sitting on boards have been there for a long time, we've not mm. been challenged and mm. have maybe not been asked these difficult questions. So period wear, boots, you know, all the stuff we're talking about, mm. sports bras, let's address that and we mm. as soon as possible. That if it's a money aspect, okay. if it's financial, let's speak to people, mm. let's speak to sponsors, let's speak to clubs. They're off the never going to change Euros. though, Jason, aren't they? But off the back of the Euros, yeah. if we're They're not going to get change. all these things yeah. now, we're never going to get yeah. them, are we? But I'm saying in terms of female athletes, mm. Those essentials are always going to be of needed. Of course. Yeah. So they were spoken about 20 years ago. They're still wow. being spoken about now. They're never going to change. They're always going to be needed. Why has nothing never been put in place? Yeah. Even like, you, even like I mean, sometimes you go to grounds and all that and mm. they haven't even got, you know, a bin within the female toilets. Yeah. yeah. We need that. Mm. Where are you supposed to put your small things that were yeah. never considered in the women's game? It's, it's mind-blowing to think that, oh yeah, we're going to train at the men's training ground. Okay, great. But, but I can't go not, to the toilet. It's not catered for. I can't, go to, the, I can't go to the bathroom. Yeah. Because it's not, yeah, it's not yeah, Male-dominated sport. Sport. Male-dominated sport. Even when I visit the clubs mm. and I go, whether it be Arsenal, Chelsea, this and the other, it's great to see that mm. there are some women's facilities that are kind of added on now. Yeah. But I do get frustrated when I hear certain things when I go and speak to the women that maybe they've not got enough medical care, mm. they've not got this, they've not got, and I'm yeah. like, well, let's, the men? let's just walk across yeah, the road the, yeah. and ask them because they've got people an abundance. Yes. And it's it's a difficult conversation. Oh, well, nobody asked me. Well, well, well I'm asking you. Mm, mm, mm. You know, in, in my That's capacity. That's what's so strange though, right? You're all you're under the same umbrella, umbrella for the same club. You're in a different right. hub across the thing. And I remember when I was at Arsenal mm. and I remember when I, when I signed it because I thought, oh, this is like, it was an opportunity that I was going to do when I was younger. Mm. Decided otherwise to go up north and um, for personal reasons. Yeah. And I come back and on paper, Arsenal 
you know, everybody knew them as the best women's team within the league and the leading, leading the way. And I went there and it was like, you can't walk across that car park because the men are going to be there. What? My car's parked Who said over that? there. Well, a lot of Pedro at the time. You can't walk across that pitch. You have to go all the way around these six pitches to go to the furthest pitch that's 10 minutes away or whatever because you can't go be seen here. We can't go into that canteen because the men will be in there at that duration. We can't go into the... We're in the gym. You've got to come out the gym because one player's doing rehab. Okay, we'll wait for an hour until he does his rehab and then we'll go in. What are we going to do with one guy? You're talking women. You're talking now the maturity has to change. You're not kids. Yeah, You're not going to get excited up. by or gassed by these yeah, guys. Go up, go up. Like, and I'm sure the men would probably like a different conversation, yeah, see a different course, face. And, you know, they don't want to be secluded from, from everything. And it was like, I'm like, this is the leading club in the women's game. Mm. And you've got all these restrictions. All of these restrictions. It blew my mind. Yeah. Honestly, it blows I my mind. I listen. I was to just it. like, wait there. I have to it's wait. Immaturity. I have to wait ten minutes before I cross the car park to go home because the men are due to leave. Yeah. Okay, cool. Which Don't is what no they sense. do with the scholars, you makes know. No so, sense. So you've got you've got like elitism, hasn't yeah. you? You got hierarchy. Yeah. You have got the men. You have got the scholars, mm. and then you have got the women. Yeah. That's crazy, right? That's it's, the way yeah. that, that yeah. football kind of yeah, looks yeah, at yeah. it. So <laughs> the scholars and the women can't cross paths with the senior pros, and that makes sense. Nah, it's embarrassing. It is. It never used to be like that, though, right? With the men, I'm on about. I mean, the whole. You the know, men's remember, always men, been that way with scholars, with you know. Their, yeah, because the boots cleaning and all that crossing past there. Listen, was... when I when I was coming up, they was trying to throw me boots to clean in it, and I wasn't feeling it. I was a terrible <laughs> scholar, like seriously. Like, like, are you throwing your dirty yeah. boots at and pick the kit up and clean the uh, baths and wash the toilets? And <laughs> oh, nah. this is manual labor. Obviously, now now they don't have to they do it. You got cleaners, yeah. but uh -huh. you know, there are still you still feel when you're going to work in in a sporting context in a football context that someone's always trying to box you in and say, well you've got to earn that or mm -mm. you can't have that. I understand you've got to earn certain rights yeah. too. But I, I also think that it should be all accessible. So eating together, yeah. you know, training, maybe being able to see young players and, and women and, and you know, if you needed a player, you'd be able to pull a player pull a over. Player 20 feet to, yeah, yeah there shouldn't be yeah. that different. I mean, a lot of the higher clubs, the Cat A clubs, the training grounds are not even in the same complex, yeah, complex or compound right. because they've got to earn mm. the right to come over. I mean, Straight sense. away, there's a separation, right? Yeah. So mm. everyone's got their own views on that, yeah. but I've never. But then agreed don't with it. don't don't say it as if everything's like that's that's the thing where you don't say it if it's not happening. Mm. If it's happening, say it. If yeah. it's not, if it's not, just don't say it mm. because you make people believe stuff, and then you're there, and it's like, whoa, what is this? Mm. All of the bullshit that's been put out there is so yeah. frustrating, honestly. But yeah, I think we've a, shared. A, I, think I, could, I could speak about that for, for hours. Well, and listen, we, we could do that we another we'll time. Part two. Yeah, we'll part do a part two. two. <laughs> but I, I think, listen, we tried to be honest with our conversation. We're trying to give people that insight because not enough people want to hear about mm. it and they're surprised. When I have conversations with people, generally off camera or off mic, whatever, I have to speak to fans. I'm brutally honest with them mm -hmm. when they're trying to say, oh, yeah, because they're moaning about something. Mm. And I tell them what my, my view and they're like, oh, I, I didn't know that or I didn't see that. But now you do. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. we've got a better understanding of now. And that's what we have to do, honestly. Yeah. Otherwise, we're never going to break down, you know, people's perceptions of how the game should look. Mm, for when... sure, especially the women's, Jason. It's because we want it to grow, right? And mm. people think in order for it to grow, you can only talk about the positive things that are happening. Yeah. You have to say about the things that aren't happening in order for those things to be better, for it to grow even bigger. Mm. But they're, no, they're scared to because it's like we're in a privileged position now because we're professional and we're getting paid. You have to paid. speak about it now. You can't paper over these cracks because mm -hmm. they'll always be there otherwise. Like the sports bars, like yeah. the tampons. That has been spoken about for years on end and we're still yeah. 20 years down the line and there's still no consideration for it. And, and they're still not being provided. we closed doors. Now we're speaking yeah. about it. On, yeah, yeah. That's my but point. I'm saying it's crazy that even that. now that they're still speaking about it. Yeah. When it should have been dealt with years ago. It should well, have been a standard, that was my shock. a standard thing. That was my shock when people were talking to me about it. Not just even at clubs. I'm like, well, what have you been doing? Like, yeah. People have been sitting on their hands literally yeah. for so long, not getting a sponsor. And, you know, you can even call out the big sponsors, mm. the Nikes and all that. Mm. There's a reason why they're not doing it because yeah. not enough people are asking for it. Yeah, sure. And they don't see commercially that there's the money mm. in it. But let's ask that question and yeah. get the high profile players, people like yourself to come out and say, this is what we need. Mm. You know, just ask those questions. If you it's don't true. ask, you don't get, right? It's true. It's true. Yeah. You know what I did? You know what I did? I did a, um, a little Q&A the other week at a school. Um, year six, five and six, and three and four, and we spoke a little bit about the Euros and and you know it was mixed. Mm. And purposely, I'm asking anyone see the celebration, lads. Yeah, what what was it? What what happened? And they, they put ah oh, the girl took her the, the top off, didn't she? And mm. you can see the little boys. Like, I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what she was wearing? 
And they're like, is it like compression? At some of the boys, is it sports? They didn't really know. Mm. We got to it. It's a sports bar. Yeah. Do you know why she did that? And I, was, I, I lied a little bit to the mm. kids so they understood why she's got it on. Mm. And I'm like, because females in sport and in this room here mm. from this age, when you do PE, it's a part of your kit. It's a part of your PE yeah. kit that they will need to wear. So I was trying to get the younger boys to understand actually you know, when you're young and you're mature, yeah. aren't they? they yeah. You know, they, it's, it's, oh, she's got a bra on because it's, some develop yeah. sooner than others. And, yeah. and for primary school kids to develop, it's like alien for boys to see that. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that women, girls, need this essential kit yeah. for their PE lessons. So it was, and, it, and like, it was really good. And the teacher said after, wow, like Perfect. really good for the boys because, but it was good that the boys knew. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. And they could answer. Yeah. So it was actually... For as much as people saying, oh, she shouldn't have took a top off because you're going to get young girls taking it off in a game. On, like, the education, I think it then does that you can then talk about in schools for boys yeah. and girls to understand mm. it's an essential part of female kit mm. if you want to be an athlete. And even if you don't and you just want to be an active person, you need to wear it. We've got to normalise. Whether it be a sports bra or a bar, it has to be worn. We've got to normalise these conversations, yeah, speak sure. about it like it's no big for deal. Sure. As I said, I grew up in a household with three <laughs> women, so these conversations yeah. are easy for yeah, me. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Sure. But for some, it's... It's like embarrassing, like, mm. grow up, man. Mm. Stop Just being immature. Yeah. <laughs> you have to bear it's with true. us. It's true. In terms of allyship, what more do you think I could do, me personally, to support the women's game? Mate, you do a lot. As you say, you think back to when I was at Arsenal when you're first coming in presenting stuff. Um, I think that's somebody of your profile anyway, the fact that you from the early days coming to the game when it weren't in a position it is, says something about yourself in terms of how you see and how you want to improve the game. So there's a lot of people that jump on it now that it's in a really good place. You've been trying to drive that for, for years for us. Um, I think it, it do what you, as you mentioned there, when you when you talk about being on, on on these boards and being in positions to to feedback stuff that you can, the more that you do that and they listen to it from, because sometimes when they hear it from a male's perspective about the female game and how you want to drive and push that, it shouldn't give an advantage, but it certainly, it, it does. It holds more more value than, than a female saying it um, so yeah I feel like when you're in the positions that you're in and you're in a few where you can help at the PFA and the FA and and feed stuff back um, it's great but I think look, you've been doing it for, for longer than, yeah, than most yeah. of the ones that are now the under the scenes I was going to say behind names not scenes. out there in terms of like you know how much you do do for the women's game mm. um, but, but you're not the type of person that needs a name out there to go I'm doing it to be doing it mm. and I think that's what's so good about it is that you're prepared to do it without what comes of it. You know, the, you know, oh, Jason Lee's doing this for our game and blah, blah, blah. You're doing it even without people rewarding you for doing it. Um, which I'm, Don't let I've me been off appreciative easy. for it. But Don't no, let me like, off you're easy. In, you've been doing it for, for years and we need people like you in our game mm. that are prepared to ask the questions, push the game in the way that it needs to be pushing for the right mm. reasons and not, token gesture just to get yourself a name which isn't what you're doing mm. hence why people don't know you're doing it well we've got this link now and we've had this mm. for a while so whatever you need mm. you know whatever I can support with just hit me up let me know okay cool alright thank you thank you listen you've been really honest about um, some some things that you've experienced you know in your personal life and over the years you know what, what are the highs and lows really you know that, that you can look back on um Representing England, I think. Even representing England um, for as long as I did. Um, I think leaving the game, being a professional. Never thought as a kid I would ever be a, a professional female footballer, although I dreamed of it. I always thought I'd be on the park with Dennis Wise or something, playing alongside him in centre mid. But you I could think, have. Yeah, I know. Playing at Wembley, uh, winning the FA Cup there, I think. Brilliant. Just because, you know, you talk about, I don't know, you know, in the cage, we'd always play like Wembley knockouts and... Mm. For me, I'd go and watch Chelsea lose there often in the FA Cup and never thought it would ever be possible for females to go and play at Wembley and, mm. and, and you know, walk the steps and lift the FA Cup. So doing that. Um, and uh, you know what? There weren't so many lows. It was more off-field lows. I think, yeah. you know, football, I, I think I prepared through my upbringing for ups and downs in the game. So... You know, although there was lows, a low for not playing is not really a low for me. It happens. It's a part of the game. Um, injuries are a part of the game. So I kind of was always prepared for, you know, if there was to be a low, it would be either not playing or being injured. Mm-hmm. You already knew that, would, that the potential for that to happen was always going to be there. Mm-hmm. I think off the field when I become homeless um, whilst playing, that was really difficult mentally because I didn't want to be honest about 
those mental problems that I was suffering with or the, you know, the mental health problems I was suffering with mm. because I was institutioned into thinking that yeah, it wasn't normal to talk about it. So mm. um, keeping that for as long as I did and not ever opening up about that was difficult. Um, yeah, and I think apart from that, I think I, I loved playing football for, for 23 years and mm. I guess that's the highlight, you know, staying at the top for 23 years and not having to drop down the leagues before I retired. Mm. Listen, you've had a fantastic career. You know, I'm hoping that you're enjoying the second phase of your life, you know, punditry, mm. being in and around the game. You've been an incredible guest. I'm not going to lie. I really enjoy talking to you and we'll continue these conversations. Part two. Part two. <laughs> we've got a lot to talk about. But listen, I'm, I'm hoping people have enjoyed this. You know, if you have, please subscribe, share, you know, share the wealth of knowledge that we've had today and... I wish you all the best in the future, Farah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.